Good morning all. Good morning. Uh, I am Sherry from Department of English. I am a college chair. My duty, My duty here is to welcome you all to this webinar. First, I welcome our principal, Dr. E.M. Abdin Asu, sir. He will be the inaugurator of this webinar. I welcome our resource person, Dr. Murali Shivaramakrishnan, sir. He is a poet, painter, professor, and a literary critic. He has authored many books, like The Mantra of Vision, Learning to Think Like Myself, and relocating strategies and methods relocating textual meaning and he has recently published a collection of poetry a notebook of a naturalist it was published in january 2020 murli sir he is a member of scientific committee of english studies university of valladolid in spain he was also a fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi and an associate of Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla. He was the founder president of SLA India, Association for Study of Literature and Environment. He is the member and coordinator of research of Human Society India. His book, his book, his name, uh, his book, Nature and Human and Nature, human nature literature, literature, Ecology, Ecology Meaning. It's a pioneering work on Indian eco-criticism. He was awarded Fulbright Postdoctoral Travel Grant to teach and research in the University of Nevada at Reno in 2006. He has backed many awards. So, our resource person. Uh, he is uh, a versatile scholar, scholar and, and he is an authority in uh, eco-criticism uh, in India. I welcome, I welcome all, the all the participants to this webinar. To this webinar. First, I welcome, First, I welcome Dr. E.M. Abdin Nasser, our college principal, to inaugurate this session, following which, following which our resource person, uh, Dr. Murali Shivaramakrishnan sir, will uh, keynote. Thank you. Respected Chief Guest, Dr. Murli Ishwaravoshan, sir. Respected faculty members of MAO College, Sri Sharif, Avarna, Tahira, Naushila, Mohammed Sharif, and other dignitaries, and my dear. Nowadays, literature and environment come together to analyze the environment and give possible solutions for the correction of the contemporary environmental issues. A new branch of literature known as eco investigates the relation between human and the natural world in the literature. One of the main goals in the uh, eco is to study how individuals in society behave and react in return to nature and ecological aspects. Green technology, green engineers, green chemistry, etc. are the part of these goals. Green literature is the study of the relationship between literature and environment to address environmental crisis. So, we have arranged a webinar on the topic People, Nature, Literature, Environment and Ethics. So we have got one of the versatile scholars in India as resource person and the topic on which he delivers a lecture is also very relevant in contemporary world. Dr. Marli Sivaramakshan is a spokesman of green literature in India. He is the president of ASLE, Association for Study of Literature and Environment. 
He is an authority of his uh, authority to speak about the literature and environment. With these few words, I declare the webinar on people and nature, literature and ecology and ethics is inaugurated. Wish you all a nice session. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Hello. Is it okay? Not visible. PowerPoint is not visible. Okay. How do I? I think you may have to share this screen. You have to share it. Yes, you can see this, right? Which one? This particular screen you can see. Good. Okay. Now, see. I'm I'm just cutting into the the screen so that right okay uh, see uh, uh, when when you when you invited me to give a webinar on uh, literature and environment and talk about critical theory in the context of nature and environment with special focus on literature I was really delighted. Primarily because, you know, this is a time when most of us are condemned to stay at home because of certain other issues outside. COVID-19, for instance, has made us all realize that there is something of an inside and an outside. So this inside and outside binary is something which actually gives us space to talk about. This is very, very, very complicated. This is really complex. And at the same time, uh, this is uh, something which, from which, is something of a sort of platform from which we can take off. Strange that we can communicate with a lot of people when we are using this uh, technology, using the web to give a webinar, seminar. This reach is amazing because you, 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 you can reach a lot of people. You can sit at home. This is like talking from my own, my own study without going to the classroom, without actually seeing the people. It has its plus points and minus points. Plus, of course, is that you know it has a large reach. The minus, the negative point is that I hardly get to see who is on the other side. And without a sort of response, you know, without a people contact, Sometimes when you talk about these issues, you, you you might be at a loss. But then assuming that you know all of us are in the same same context and we are able to think critically about this issue, let me launch into this people and nature, literature, ecology, and ethics. Now, if the PowerPoint is visible, this is well and good. I think you may have to share this PowerPoint. Once you share it, then you can yes. Right. Okay. Now, see, people and nature are interlinked. I use the word people rather than, you know, uh, mobs, crowds, and so many other, you know, uh, uh, mass, this sort of terms. Uh, because I use the word specifically to, to give that feeling of, you know, individuals in a particular society. What is what is not visible? We will. Have, it will take some time for us to get the whole thing organized. I guess. Now, now am I am I audible? Not visible. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Point. Okay. Ah, yes. If I if I hear that, then it would be it would be good. So from the beginning again. Now is it visible? No, because I need you to see what I what I, what I am talking about. No, not it. I think you may have to share it. Share the screen. Do I share the screen here? Share screen. Yes, I have done that. Share, turn on captions. More options, settings, turn on caption, full screen. How do I share this? Turn off camera, turn leave call, no nothing. No way, I don't know. So you have to present to the screen. Pardon? 
I have to present the screen. Instead of joining, you have to present. Where there is that? Your entire there screen. Outside. Right. Yeah. Is it there? Now it is visible? Oh, but the entire screen is visible. Is that okay? Not it. Hmm? Not it. Yeah. Is it okay now? Your entire screen in a window. Right now, you got it. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, you can see this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, great. Now, right, yes, sir. yes, sir. but I missed out on what see halfway through. If I just present this, then I will not be no. Can you see it? No. Uh, no? You can see it? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Which one? You can see the whole screen or just part of it? No, uh, we can see. No. See the whole screen. You can see the whole screen, but I want you to see only the PowerPoint so that my, you know, Double slide show how to do that. Now you see the screen. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Right? Which okay, sir. Yeah, okay, sir. Now you can see the split screen, right? Yeah. Is it okay? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, as I said, you know, uh, literature, as we have already, you know, discussed over the years in our classrooms and even outside, something that is creative, something that is based out of human imagination, is usually not created by individuals. This is quite strange because we assume that an individual writes something, an individual thinks, an individual is able to see and react to society and society in turn, in terms of a, a binary, you know, links up with literature. So, li I mean, the, the literary, the person who creates literature. So literature and society in many ways are interlinked. We know that, okay? Can you hear me now? No response. Hello? Yes, sir. Now everything is okay. Ah, now, now everything is okay. Very good. Okay. Now let us go to the basic premises of my, my lecture. If you can see the slide, you can see that people and nature, which I'm going to talk about, is an exploration of human interaction with nature. Human society, human history, particularly, does not take into consideration environmental history, because we assume that human history is a history of human actions. But we don't recognize that, you know, there is a whole environment which actually creates our history. But human existence is never independent of nature. But nature and humankind are interdependent. So there is an interdependency which we have to recognize. And this is one of the, the basic premises from which I'm starting. The history of Earth is for the most the history of human interaction with the environment. Although environmental factors influenced human history, the scars which human beings have inflicted on non-human nature are more palpable, more recognizable. Now, in geological terms, what we call Anthropocene, we have entered in a, a new era of Anthropocene. Now, Anthropocene is an era where human action with environment, human action with earth and other living creatures has created a bigger impact. Last century, 20th century, most of us who are listening to, I mean, most of you who are listening to this lecture, all of us, in fact, are 
were born in the last century and we recognize that the last century was a very significant century a century in which you know we have gone through so much revolutions changes world wars and much which has happened in terms of you know human nature interaction humanism was one of the prime human you know humanism was one of the the prime uh, 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 isms or ideological movements which came out of the last century in fact it has its roots as early as the greek times it's one of the earliest movements in fact or thinking where human beings have been placed at the center of everything human beings are most important human history is very important human emotions and human uh, uh, you know experience becomes the center screen for everything and the idea of humanism was very very strong at the earliest times last uh, uh, you know i have quoted from william faulkner faulkner in one of his major speeches that is his speech which he gave when he gave, when he when he received the nobel prize mentioned that ultimately mankind will not only survive but prevail you know when when he mentioned that most of us would have been thrilled because we recognize that human beings have always struggled to make their you know existence meaningful and valuable in this world and when as as a spokesperson for a humanist view faulkner makes this statement that mankind will not only really survive but prevail the idea of humanism enters this center stage but however within a short span of this period we have come to realize that that we have entered a new era of anthropocene anthropocene is the 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 the, the geological term for the, the the new age viewed as a period during which human actions and human activities have been a dominant influence on the climate change and changes on earth and the environment we have come to such a pass that human activities have serious impacts on the earth's climate on environment bio biodiversity the variations of the species you know the multiple species that inhabit the earth including the human beings this is a cause for concern now this is a cause for concern for even literature students who believe that you know they are dealing just with a text or they are talking about imagination this is very significant for anyone who is concerned with human beings and nature and life however literature and art have always explored the relationship of nature and human beings in their own independent and various ways human culture is interlinked with outer and inner nature of course in their own different ways an inquiry into literature and environment literature and ecology into imaginative creativity of human beings and the environment it has multiple dimensions it can move into a search for human people identities in the natural order you know this question of identity question of what it becomes what what it means to be a human the question of what it means to be part of a society all those things are quite significant and we can also explore the possibilities of finding the kind of natural order in which human beings and their people uh, identities as people occur or on the other hand we can also explore the theoretical and the conceptual parallels we can also look at the way in which you know action and awareness you know, action what do we mean by human action how can our action either kill or save the earth this sort of things you know. what does this it means to exist in a particular culture how does climate change occur is it something that has happened because of human interaction with nature or is it a kind of natural process that climate change actually affects us as individuals in a social order and what is ecological disaster what is nature and what is the meaning of conservation now i have brought in too many aspects into one particular uh, 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 you know slide 
Okay. Now, as a as a student of literature, many okay. students who are listening to me, or as a scholar who uh, uh, who is concerned with individual literature in and its conceptual and issues, or as you know, scholars who are well versed in multiple disciplines in other disciplines, I have this you will so see that you know it has into one tremendous implications. Uh, uh, you know, this right. has you know now, a, a different a sort of dimension as a scholar because I am also talking about the virtual space and a virtual environment issues, which we have created you know, in the concept of culture. Human beings over the years have created something called culture, which is actually a virtual environment. But strangely, enough, this particular culture which we have created as a virtual environment may not have any direct contact with the physical world has actually impacted the physical culture. How has this impacted the physical culture? There is no reason why we should Think about it, but I think we have to think about it in which is the present because any anxiety about the past or the future in the present is very, very significant because we are living in what is called in a possibility for a technosphere. As actually, all technical terms, sometimes you know, we might assume that this is part of what is called science fiction. Why we should discuss only science fiction and in science fiction, we talk about this different kinds of spheres, but we have to recognize that past. As you hold rows to the three, is very very significant because we are talking about this called philosopher, you know, a person who has worked on ecology, philosophy, environment, part and ethics, of which I will be speaking about in a few minutes. He has mentioned that in the future, technosphere could supersede the bios. Holds rows to the three. That is the impact of culture. So, but whatever it is, we have come to a person who has worked the on the point where uh, we may uh, even have to talk, talk about the end of nature as we know it. We have already spoken about the end of human concepts which are human-centric, which are humanistic, which actually focus on the human being as such. And we so, may have to speak about the end of history, which we have already learned in the last century itself. Ideologically, we have spoken about the possibility of human history itself closing, coming to an end of closure. So the end, the, the end of last millennium and the beginning of the new millennium is something which focuses on a kind of you know, uh, 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 in a on a global scale to speak about the end of history. And this is Anthropocene. This is the the whole focus of Anthropocene. The possibility now, this Anthropocene, Anthropocene as such is something which is marked by interrelated, potentially cataclysmic human environmental impacts. Which means that, you know, we have come to a point where our impact has cataclysmic, that is the end of destructive, tremendously destructive impact. By How is it impacting mass extinction, invasive species, climate change, increased atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, rising sea levels, dumping of nuclear waste or chemical waste, whatever it is, you know, you can, you can see the, the kinds of, you know, the levels to which we can go to, which actually is impacting our life and nature. And we have come to a point where they have been you know, five mass extinctions in the, in the earlier times and in, in, uh, in paleontological terms, we, we, we would say that, you know, we are also entering into the Anthropocene, which is absolutely destructive, destructive on a mass uh, scale as such. And climate change, then you can see the, the impact of tsunamis, in the earlier CO2 emissions, rising sea levels. I'm not going to frighten you by showing the statistics of mass. Anyone who is very keen on these issues can go on the on the on the net and then easily because we live in a sort of information age where whatever I'm saying you can actually key in and you can actually enter that and cite it and then find it on your own. Book. So you can search for all this information. Issue, the statistics, the levels to which we have gone, you know, but then you may not be able to get the perception uh, that, that uh, we are trying to drive at, you know.
Mm. All because information is already at our fingertips. The range and level of our destruction we have already found. And the possibilities for whatever future is going to hold levels to which we have as the science fiction we are also able to understand. You may not be also realize that along with this sort of you know the decay and degeneration of our environment, the destruction, the mass destruction of our species, which 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 inhabit the earth, you know, and at a speedy scale, in a sort of you know. In a geometric scale, it is not as if it is going in a mathematical order, in you know, one, two, three, four kind of level. But in square, you know, it squares every minute, which is frightening. The harm and the impact which we can hold on the environment is terrible. To the level of you know, garbage and waste dumping, you know, but the amount of garbage which we have produced. There are several other factors involved in that, you know, human history, the the the, the, the sort of consumption that we are, uh, uh, the, the, the consumptive culture which we are going into, the market-oriented, uh, you know, uh, development culture which we have created, the urbanization, and sort of, you know, what I I have called in playfully in another in another context, the coca colonization, you know, Coca Cola and coca colonization, whatever we have uh, had, all this sort of thing has led us to. What is called the maximum, the, the 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 sort of you know absolute destructive uh, position where garbage, waste dump, dumping. Not only that, you know, nuclear waste and whatever happens in space, the terrible things which we are uh, uh, you know uh, doing all around. The reach is unimaginable. It is more fictional than anything. You know, it 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 it, it goes beyond fiction. So it is a sort of uh, you know, we don't know whether we are in the world of fact or uh, in in fiction, fashion perhaps. So, and maybe ultimately, COVID nineteen, where, where we have come to, uh, is something which calls for a change in perspective, because this COVID situation, which has actually made a platform for what I am talking, you know, for this seminar, the the, the COVID situation, which has actually. Uh, challenged human societies. It has called our sort of, you know, gregariousness. Human society, people and human beings, people who are mass people in a in a in a society who are gregarious, human beings and gregarious. And we have we have to maintain a sort of one meter distance between each other because we have been forbidden to touch one another. So we are actually isolated from nature, and COVID has given us this this possibility for. Reflecting on the order of inside and outside. Now, this social distancing, uh, I don't know whether it, we call it social distancing, but uh, I think uh, we should, uh, uh, I'm getting some messages. Uh, am I audible? Please tell me it is audible. Is it okay? Ah, okay. Now, uh, okay. The social distancing or what I call the physical distancing. Is this an act of maintaining a certain physical distance between us and all things? This one meter distance, one meter distance between us, the the distance which we keep, which has actually isolated us. So when we use the word social distancing, we are calling the entire society into question. There's so many other factors which have made us, uh, you know, uh, uh, separate from each other. You know, there are social. As I said, you know, our the virtual uh, uh, environment which we have created as culture has actually segregated human beings about us in in several ways. You know, have and have not. You know, different kinds of skin texture, color, culture, and uh, uh, you know, power and position, and several ways in which our social structure has actually distanced. Uh, the human beings from one another. That is also something which we can actually challenge because a change in perspective actually will help us understand. Now, the point which I am trying to uh, uh, focus on here is from the human centric to the biocentric. We are moving from a sort of, you know, anthropocentric position. Anthropocentric, which actually focuses on the human centric thing. I have already mentioned the ideas of humanism and human centered kind of thing. The concerns for what it means to be a human again, just alone, being a human alone. And from there, we need to move to what is called the biocentric. Now, there are technical terms which are uh, a little bit involved here. And to, in order to, for the, for the, for the, for the common reader of literature, for a student of literature, for a, a student who reads into literature and comes into the whole world of the literary, if you just explore the level to which environmental studies in the present 
has uh, uh, you know given us the unimaginable level to uh, uh, i just looked at the uh, the, the, the keywords that uh, you know joni adamson has given in in her uh, recent study uh, she has uh, done a, a book on keywords for me on my studies now keywords is very important after raymond williams you know the, the, when we look at any any theoretical uh, pursuit we recognize that there are certain key concepts you know, corner concepts which actually help us you can level of uh, the environment and the level of you know uh, human studies i mean uh, the human animal studies human nature studies all those things have reached unimaginable so no i i have come to the second part of my lecture actually this was just an introductory sort of thing i have spoken about what i call the two e's ecology and environment and then i have also spoken about economics in fact it could be the three e's but i want the third e also and that is the ethics so ecology and environment are significant in the context of even english literature or literature written in english or what we discuss in the classroom as literature because we recognize that economics matters economics is something which has actually made us recognize that human history is a history of development you know what we call progress what we call urbanization is something which actually uh, uh, you know has brought us to this particular position and economics matters so we have seen ecology a little bit of ecology i'll be speaking about eventually because ecology is a science and we will see how this recent science you know it's a nascent science nascent in the sense 17th century onwards so it becomes very very recent in the past in this way and what has necessitated ecology how ecology came to be and things like but is there is a fashion for people to talk about ecology in the ramayana ecology in the mahabharata this is a misnomer this is a misuse of a technical term because we, we will take it up when we have time for discussion you know ecology as such the whole concept of ecology became necessary became a necessity in the human constitutional debate and you know we had come to such a pass that you know development has brought us to a stifling situation where we have to recognize the web of life that is the whole process of uh, ecology but environment has always been there human environment the cultural environment and whatever we have considered as around human beings now how this inside and outside how inside the human being how the existence of the human being impacts his or her environment how how the environment outside becomes part of the inside this is something which actually takes us to the third e with which i you know i would like to come to the next point which is ethics now before we move on to ethics i have to talk a little bit about you know between the studies and how this has been important to us many people assume that you know they they use the word eco criticism uh, eco aesthetics uh, as if it is just another given no this is not something which is given to us this has evolved over a whole process of you know the pursuit of literary theory and literature in the classrooms now literature uh, language and culture has actually um uh, i have used the word the common woman's point of view not to show that you know this is not as if the common man's point of view this is not merely the the process of you know what happened this is not merely the uh, uh, the process of uh, maintaining a gender a gendered sort of vision not like that so this is more like you know recognizing the the, the presence of the woman now the common woman's point of view is something which actually talks about literature or reading or getting into the the the, the literary is a sort of uh, uh, pleasure oriented entertainment oriented or information oriented a lot of people read books for the sake of you know uh, filling their vacuums for the sort of entertainment why, why do you pick up a book it's like watching a cinema or listening to a piece of music or then reading poetry or reading fiction or watching uh, 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 going into the theater to watch a play so it, it it's not merely information or entertainment alone because there is another aspect which the academician would try to bring in 
the teacher of literature or the scholar of, scholar of literature would like to focus on what is called knowledge literature also brings in a certain knowledge certain awareness now these are all technical terms we should realize they are all loaded terms you know, entertainment information knowledge we can question all these things at the same time is it merely entertainment entertainment for what whose entertainment from which point of view what is the focus of attention all these questions you can raise information whose information what information where does it lead to where does it originate what is the whole politics of information knowledge what is this power of knowledge where did this focus of knowledge come from all these are questions which you can ask even as a common reader you can ask these questions when you read a book when you read when you when you try to react with a, a poem you can also or uh, watching a film or whatever you can also focus on these questions you know entertainment information knowledge all those things because you can also raise questions on theories and conceptual issues a lot of teachers a lot of principals comments and students are put off the moment you say theory they will say hey, come on i don't want to have anything to do with theory why are you bringing all this theoretical you know mountains because i just want to read and enjoy i like to sit in my study or i like to sit in my own bedroom and then enjoy or read read with a kind of you know religiosity i read the bible i read the quran i read the gita or the ramayana and then whatever i am reading i am reading to make sense of of a kind of religion with a, with a certain religiosity i am reading with a sense of openness which will give me a kind of spiritual awareness or maybe uh, uh, enhance or uh, make me better morality all those things we will eventually come to that point so then this theoretical conceptual frameworks actually gives us ways of meaning making because there is a technique technique there is a form in literature with which we have to be very familiar with if we have to understand its theme because the way in which something is said is very important the manner in which you try to make meaning is very very important because if the modality The, the the methodology of form actually creates a kind of feel the what of literature is in many ways dependent on how of literature it is good to know a little bit of the how of literature rather than be a just a common reader there is no common reader we should realize that nobody is a kind of you know cut a, 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 a blank card everyone has something some loads of information or some way in which you your judgment is decided when you read or respond to a work of art so with all these things in the background it is good to approach Uh, literature now there is a very significant uh, uh, literary critic a, an eco critic an ecologically sensitive critic who is considered to be the grandmother of uh, you know ecological studies can you see this quote cheryl glod felty everybody who is involved in uh, ecologically sensitive criticism could certainly have come across cheryl cloud felt the american critic okay i will quote read it literature does not float above the material world in some aesthetic ether but rather plays a part in an immensely complex system in which energy matter and ideas interact in a perpetual dance it's a very significant thought we use the term eco criticism ecologically sensitive criticism eco criticism is a critical term and sometime back when the principal who very very kindly invited me is uh, uh, the principal made a mention of eco criticism eco criticism is a critical term in a specific context it gives a register it creates a critical quality for these times it's something like a register some in linguistic terms we use this word register so it's a register which has a specific meaning in a specific context it has a specific self reflectivity behind it okay environmental criticism which i would like to use is a more inclusive 
more than linguistics more than merely literary kind of thing am i am i going faster than what you can get is it okay okay no because the point is to make some kind of contact and communication yeah because in literary critical terms in 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 uh, uh, you know in the in the in the context of the green studies and environmental studies we like to use the word contact and communication it's very important to have the uh, uh, communication clearly uh, in another context you know branching away if you were to uh, study the sanskrit you have to uh, if you want to go into sanskrit philosophy or uh, theories in sanskrit linguistics uh, it is said that you know if you have to finish 12 years of study 11 years you have to study the grammar and then once you are familiar with the grammar you can go to the to the, the higher levels of philosophy why it is so uh, um, it is so because you know you need to be clear about what you are uh, uh, you know communicating we have to have the cards on the table as plato would say so environmental criticism is a sort of inclusive it is more than merely linguistic terms and it is a, uh, more than literary terms it is concerned with key words here justice ethics values rights of non human world of the biosphere itself because when we are concerned with environmental criticism we are concerned with ideas of justice now we have a certain idea of human justice when human beings are or create any kind of you know a, 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 a trouble in society we know how to deal with them we have our legal systems and we have a sense of justice there in a similar way you know we do have certain concern with environment and there is something called environmental justice with which i will i will deal few in a, in a few minutes now this notions of justice which actually you know is is something which is founded which is grounded on uh, uh, ethical values ethics as well as values and the rights of non human world this is very important we have to recognize that when we talk about human rights there are a lot of people to talk about human rights it's not that i am demeaning it please don't be under the impression that you know a person who is concerned with nature and environment is less concerned with human beings this is why i use the term people and environment i have specifically used the word people people matter environment matters people and environment environment and people all in whichever way whichever power structures you keep it they are very very important because we are all part of a web of life now as much we are concerned with human rights we have also to recognize that there is a non human world outside which has an equal right so there is a right of biosphere which we have to be concerned with now in the in in how did we come to this eco critical theory in a, in a little you know uh, uh, historical diversion we have to come to that in uh, literary studies we have always been reading a text and making sense of it and we have also recognized that you know i have drawn a triangle here all of you can see that on the on the, on the screen there is a kind of triangular relationship between the text the author and the reader the text is created by the author and the text is made sense by the reader so there is a kind of connection between the reader and the author the reader the author and the text are interrelated through the text the reader goes into the author the author relates with the reader the author creates the text the text in fact creates the author so there is a kind of you know a, a connection a contact between these things these aspects over a, 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 a period of 100 years we have Uh, in the context of literary studies we have shifted our focus from the author to the text to the reader where the author was very important when you are reading you read the work and you say okay the author is very very important the authorial voice is very important the author's intention is very important the author's concept of meaning what did the author actually mean here what did words words mean when he said you know 10000 saw i take glance or Uh, when he talks about the, the solitary reaper we assumed that author had a say in the matter eventually you know literary theorists came and in the classroom the teacher the student and the research scholar recognized that the text was of a little importance in fact more importance 
not of a little importance it was more important the text is very important so seize the text catch the text speak only about the text when when, when we were uh, 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 students we were taught by the great uh, new critics you know the, the, the shadow of the new critics was something which actually uh, uh, fell into our classrooms so that the, the explication of a text the text is of primary importance we need to explicate the text we need to understand the text we need to look at the key terms in the text we need to look at the relationship between the the, the speech and the tone and the voice in the text and the text becomes of importance and the author is practically dead the author is dead the creator is dead we don't care who created it who is the the, the, the author of ramayana who is the author of uh, uh, mahabharata we are not concerned with all this we assume because we are only interested in the text if there are a million ramayanas fine we will just look at the million ramayanas as different different texts and we should we will try to go into the text and to make sense of it eventually we recognized that the reader was of great importance so the, the reader response theory came in under a uh, uh, fourth thread the reader became of paramount importance who makes sense ultimately who makes sense the reader makes the sense the text is already there as a kind of repository of certain meanings which the author has uh, uh, you know put it now the reader is supposed to go and grapple with it and make some sense of it so the reader has a, a, a presupposed uh, a position so there is a sort of implied reader in the text and the reader has to go and catch it when the author implies a reader the reader actually focuses on the implied reader uh, kills it or breaks it or deconstructs it puts it on the head and then have a contrapuntal movement and comes out of it and the reader makes the sense of a text so the essence of a text is in the hands of the reader the reader can make or break a text so the reader becomes of paramount importance we have to recognize that the, the whole point of our you know uh, trying to make sense to theory has moved from the author to the text to the reader and it keeps on moving sometimes the author becomes important sometimes the text becomes important sometimes the reader becomes important now in the whole process we have to recognize that there is an exchange of meaning it's actually a whole cultural process if there is a printed text there is a printed meaning behind it you know, the printed text is something which we assume the print is final you know the, the, the writing which is final but then the print is only a transparent move and we tend to go beyond that so there is no finality for a printed text even if there is a printed text or an oral text the text is already there and the reader makes the sense of the text despite the fact that it is oral it is shifting written which is equally shifting when there is a printed text or a virtual text in the in the in the, in the present day uh, uh, technologically sophisticated social media networks we have the virtual text we assume that the text that we do texting that we do just disappears in the virtual world sometimes it doesn't it comes to haunt you so the, there is a haunting specter in every text whether it is a oral text or a written text or a virtual text there are the specters which are haunting the reader at the same time now all these things actually gives us what i said at the early uh, 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 at the beginning of my lecture there is a kind of you know uh, world which actually is controlled by certain cultural values which are virtually cultural values which are created in a virtual world which we assume do not have any impact on the outside world these cultural values are actually contained within our economic structures the structures which we build the development uh, you know the, the, the jargon which we use the development uh, 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 you know ideology with which we have actually created our own progressing history but all these points to one particular concept which we have kind of you know laid aside it took a person like shumaha e f shumaha in the 80s brought out a small book which is called small is beautiful now i am not trying to pin all this process of you know ecology into this book but here is a book which actually focused on a study of economics as if people matter shumaha actually focused on 
the whole process of our growth and he said okay we are all progressing human beings are progressing the western world is developing and the other world the which is the other world the third world which is also uh, uh, progressing can you hear me is my voice breaking is it all right yes yes hello yeah okay yes, now we ah uh, okay thank you for some response from you you know it will give me an idea of you know whether i am making sense so we have realized that you know a small is beautiful small things are beautiful we think about mega structures in our whole you know dialogue of uh, uh, you know development we assume that everything is actually uh, mega we think in large scale terms, you know, huge mega things when we have a small dam we assume why not make a bigger dam so that we can we can produce more Uh, uh, you know, electricity. More, uh, uh, you know, more can be consumed. So the more becomes very, very important. But here, Shumahar is talking about small is beautiful. Small things are beautiful. Why not just look at pause in our? I mean, give it a pause and then think about what we are actually uh, com- uh, considering as development. In our development syndrome, there's a small pause. Shumahar owes a great deal to Mahatma Gandhi. So the whole idea of uh, you know I'm not trying to link Mahatma Gandhi to ecology because if you were to read through Mahatma Gandhi's works you will find that he doesn't use the word ecology or environment or ecological justice but he is speaking specifically about small scale things you know thinking living uh, and thinking at the same time in smaller and larger scales now uh, as we have gone in to the study of literature and environment how does it Uh, uh, help us. How does it aid us when we look at all these issues which I have just mentioned? A little bit of science, a little bit of biology, a little bit of development studies, and now what does it mean when we look at you know literature and the environment? Many people think that you know talking about literature and the environment is to talk about wilderness or forest because we assume that while and the forest are those that are counter to our nature and culture our nature our own inner nature and our culture because it is also equally important to be engaged with the issues of conservation and preservation fine this is also important but there are other other factors that lead us from the literary text and its context we will see that we have seen that you know when we do literary studies or study into the history of literature class race gender these are some of the conceptual tools which we use as for the understanding human societies so i have given one very uh, you know casual example from gayatri chakravarti's pivak all of you would have read the text and i I'm, i'm sure all of you are familiar with it and gayatri chakravarti's pivak you know she brings out this focus of attention of the world on subaltern studies and she asked this question can the subaltern speak you know we are talking about so many issues here literature uh, literary studies uh, the the text the subtext the contrapuntal movement deconstruction and all those things can the subaltern who does not have the language who is deprived of language can the subaltern speak and she asked this question in a similar way we can ask this question can nature speak nature doesn't have any 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 tongues other than human beings so in a similar way when we look at class race and gender and we use them as conceptual tools in trying to understand our literary text or the texts which are given through literature we can also use nature as a sort of conceptual tool now there are so many eco critics practicing in the present over the last 20 years you know two decades many of them might even take offense and they say no 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 nature is not a conceptual tool. nature is not something which can be actually uh, uh, you know contained within the the cultural sphere of the human dialogues or the human discourses because there are people who can ask this question see the hole in the ozone layer the hole in the ozone layer is not a literary uh, 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 
fact. It's not something which can be analyzed from our grammatical discourses. This is a fact. So how do we, I mean, these are all more points which uh, uh, we can take up eventually. So in the context of the literary, uh, we can see that ecological criticism, as I have just mentioned, ecological theory or theory of, of which is actually informed by ecological studies, focuses on the relationship between literature and the physical environment. Literature and the physical environment, whether it is part of the text, outside the text. Just as feminist criticism examines language and literature from a gender conscious perspective. And Marxist criticism brings an awareness of modes of production and economic class to its reading of text. Ecologically sensitive criticism takes an earth-centered approach. Now, earth is of great importance. Human-centric approach is fine, but we are moving towards an earth-centric approach. That is a very important thing because we are moving away from what is necessary only for human beings. When we are planting a tree, now we are greening the world. We are just planting trees. Even uh, uh, indigenous people have turned to planting trees because their own forests are totally destroyed. When we plant a tree, what do you ask the first question? Is this tree of use to us? Am I planting a tree which is going to be of use to me? Now, that is again a human-centered approach. We can plant a useless tree in the sense nothing is useless in nature. We assume that, you know, whatever is useful is something useful for human beings. It will give shade to the human being or it will give a fruit to a human being or it will bring some fortune to a human being. Whichever levels you are looking at, whichever physical level or the meaningful level or the enjoyment level or the spiritual level, whatever dimensions you are looking at, you are looking at it from a human-centric perspective again. So these are all tricky sense where you have to be careful. Now, this is why we have this factor of human nature, human beings and nature as such. This is a sort of binary. You know, human beings are assumed to be uh, opposite of nature. There is a human versus. You don't worry. Uh, am I am I clear? Can, can you see this? Okay. Now, human nature is a sort of you know, yeah, a changing relationship of humans with nature, history, and culture. Human beings dominate nature. We assume that you know human beings actually dominate nature. Now, when we garden, we have a concept of a garden. We have flowering plants. We have beautiful plants with beautiful leaves, and we also have, you know, plants which are, we consider as weeds. So we weed the plant, we remove. So the whole process of gardening is a process of weeding or removing what is considered as wild. The forest will take over. Forest means not particularly useful for the human being. So the human being's concept of garden is to keep aside wild nature. So there is this culture versus nature idea. You know, if you have a wild backyard or your, your friend yard when somebody comes into your house is wild, they say this is wild. It has to be cropped. It has to be maintained. It has to be, you know, systematically ordered into a sort of garden. So this idea of culture versus nature is a sort of binary. Now, this binary has always been there. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, eco-critical studies focuses on this binaries. And they say, is there actually a binary? Where does nature end and culture begin? Where does culture stop and nature begin? Aren't they extensions of each other? If you are looking at humans' activities or nature, whatever is biologically valuable, whatever is biologically maintainable, whatever is biologically viable, that's sustainable, that is something which is a positive. But that which is destructive is something which does not maintain this balance in an equitable way. You know, we will look at that later. Rousseau, 
in, in this discourse on inequality and social health, Rousseau is supposed to be the philosopher of the wild, the uh, natural uh, philosopher, going back to uh, uh, the wild. Let me turn away from this civilized society, civil society, and go back to a society which is uncorrupted. In nature, there is so much uncorruption. Now, these are all uh, uh, moot points which we can take up when we discuss you know. Now, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, wrote Walden, where he lived in Walden near the Walden Pond for a long time, and he entered his diaries. One of the most significant observations which he makes, quote unquote, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to friend only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. And not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. Now for Rousseau, as well as Thoreau, nature held the meaning of life. You go back to nature, discover the, uh, 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 the real fact of life, and not when you come to die, recognize that you haven't lived. If you have to live, you, you find meaningfully you, you live deliberately. You find your own active meaning when you go to a, a forest. So this is something like uh, going back and uh, uh, recovering the values of nature. In the present, whether you are living in the west or in the east or in the north or in the south, we are all, you know, people who enter into a discourse with nature. This discourse with nature now is based on aggrandizement and power of the human power. This is a human-centric approach. I keep on repeating that. This is actually an anthropocentric approach. Now, this view appears to be natural and normal. This is quite tricky because isn't it natural for human beings to create their own world? This is a point for scholars who are actually deeper into the, the, the whole questions of philosophy of nature. You know, I, I can raise a, 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 a problematic here. Uh, even in the Mahabharata, you know, there are places where, you know, uh, uh, Arjuna and uh, Krishna go and kill the number of animals and birds which flee from a particular forest. When they are burning, when they allow Agni to devour that forest. There's a context there. And a lot of, you know, uh, intellectuals, a lot of uh, uh, ideological debates have focused on this particular point. Isn't that actually the destruction through fire and iron? This is the whole evo evolution of human societies. Through fire and iron, uh, uh, you know, iron we are destroying uh, nature as such. Forest and the wild is already being destroyed. And there is a kind of, you know, takeover by the forces of culture. This appears to be quite natural. Well, we have so much uh, uh, possibilities for discussing this particular issue eventually. But then what we should realize that this comes out of a certain anthropocentric yeah. and utility oriented philosophy with which we try to read and we try to focus our attention on. So this anthropocentric and utility oriented way makes us feel that this appears to be natural. And all this human centric approach is a given something which is natural as such. This is a kind of intermingling of culture and nature. Whatever has been created, whatever has been culturally created, whatever has been uh, uh, you know, brought out through a kind of discourse, conceptual discourse, is something which appears to be quite natural here. But now, this brings me to the third point, which is ethics. What is the relevance of ethics in all this discourse which we are having here? I think ethical discourse or a sense of ethics is the most significant thing and it can be derived from the literary. It's not as if literature gives you a kind of panacea, an answer to all these things. Many people assume, okay, you are writing a book and the book is actually something which gives me a solution. It's not as if you get an, uh, uh, you put your finger in and pick out a solution. No, it gives you a certain perspective. The perspective is not damaging. The perspective is something which, with, with which you have to think. You have to ruminate. In Sanskrit, they say manana. You, know? you have to put it into your mind and you have to reflect on it. Ethics is concerned with what is good for individuals and society. And it is also described as a moral philosophy. There is a human-centered ethics. There is a natural ethics. 
because human centric ethics is what is important for human beings and what is significant for human societies alone this is what actually ethical sense means but then now we have to realize that is uh, ethics and aesthetics are quite close to each other uh, uh, this is quite uh, complicated so i'm just because of want of time lack of time i'm just moving a little fast here so i'm just talking about eco aesthetics which actually brings together you know uh, uh, ecology ethics economics environment and aesthetics together this is what actually we we recognize as Uh, uh, eco aesthetics um, aesthetic theory is concerned with values so eco aesthetics actually is concerned with values now values are not something which are permanent there are no eternal values in that way values change but significance for a particular moment is something which we can recognize through a kind of ethical relationship values may not be eternal they, they won't be given but at the same time certain things like love affection pity sympathy compassion these are all thing or tolerance whatever we in the last relations you use the word tolerance not compassion when you speak about religion when you speak about the buddha and zena and uh, christ or muhammad we can talk about compassion understanding and compassion but whatever way which whichever discourse you are using we have to recognize that it's a sort of participation that is called for participation is a recognizing of certain responsibilities and that is a very very significant thing in the context of you know ecological aesthetics when we talk about ecology ethics and environment and literature we have to recognize that we are actually talking about a philosophy which uh, leads us to sympathy understanding compassion and um, so three things which i would like to focus attention in the context of uh, literary aesthetics and talking about the ethics of nature meaning meaning is not something which is holistic i mean meaning is holistic i'm so sorry there's a word there means meaning is holistic and not fragmentary meaning is something that is total it's not something which can be taken piecemeal so meaning is not fragmentary it is holistic so the philosophy of natural aesthetics nature aesthetics or eco aesthetics takes us to literary meaning which is holistic and not fragmentary it also focuses on the second point which is values which are individual and collective thing ethical and aesthetic at the same time and the third point is responsibility responsibility for the human as well as the non human now this is very important because we have to recognize that there are others other than human beings who inhabit this world and that is the most important thing i think i will skip all these things because this is the history of uh, uh i think i will just speak about one more very important uh, 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 thinker who has contributed to this idea of uh, uh, eco aesthetics ecology and aesthetics who may not have directly influenced it but who has a whole philosophy called deep ecology now deep ecology is uh, uh, as the term itself shows there is a surface ecology and counter to it is deep ecology so when you are talking only about certain uh, aspects of sustainable development certain ideas to you know uh, uh, something which is sustainable maintainable which is rational which is viable uh, when we are using such concepts it again means that it is human centric deep ecology goes counter to all this human centric things it is very close to spirituality it is also called ecosophy because it is philosophy and ecology it can be even biosophy for that matter because it is not merely talking about ecology it also talks about all life forms not from the human center there are some factors which are names the philosopher who was very much influenced by mahatma the norwegian philosopher arne names actually 
talks about. So three or four points which I would like to highlight that leap ecologists have uh, maintained. A rejection of anthropocentrism, which I have been talking so far about human-centered kind of thing. All life on Earth has an intrinsic value. The idea of intrinsic is something which is taken up by uh, a, 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 you know, philosophers, ethic, uh, moral philosophers and uh, philosophers who speak on ethics. They talk about intrinsic value. What is intrinsic value? Intrinsic value is irrespective of the human angle. Uh, something is valuable on itself, not dependent, not something which is actually uh, uh, you know, contingent. This is something very important. So here, uh, richness and biodiversity are valuable in themselves. It's very important that we have to maintain uh, uh, richness and biodiversity. Richness and biodiversity are valuable in themselves. And humans have no right to reduce this diversity. Human beings do not have a right. Because as I said at the beginning, we talk about human rights, but we also have to be aware of not only animal rights as such, but bird rights, insect rights, amphibian rights, life rights, rights of other than human beings. And that is what actually takes us towards a higher level of an identification with all life. This is something which deep ecologists swear by. They talk about caring for other life forms as part of individual's self-realization. Any individual who actually uh, uh, sublimates himself, sublimation of the individual self. When people become aware of themselves, they have to recognize that they have to give care as part of their self-realization. Self-realization actually means caring for the other. This is not contradictory when an individual, it's not an aggrandizement as you have seen. It's not a mere you know, the, the development of sublimation in terms of power, but sublimation in terms of a sort of understanding, a kind of inclusiveness, a synthesis, not a forced kind of, you know, uh, uh, forcing of power. So then this is a critique of instrumental rationality. This actually uh, raises questions about rationality and instrumental rationality. Because we assume that, you know, nowadays when you, when you talk about uh, 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 efficiency, efficiency in terms of quantity, the number of things which you can produce, number of things you can make big, the mega thing. That is not what is important. You can talk about the smallest beautiful part of things. Yes, Hello? So, this is something which you have to uh, recognize that the, the critique of uh, uh, what I have said, you know, uh, it should not be on uh, the, the insistence, the insistence shouldn't be on quantity, but on quality. No, personal development of a total worldview, that is a very important thing. Individual thinking and action are of utmost significance and later the collective and the social. All those things are very important. The individual factor is also important. It's not as if when you are building a big dam, you, what you are doing is you are actually throwing away the indigenous people. They become landless again and you are creating another suburban fear. They are all driven to seek existence in the urban context and you are disposing them. That is not how you go about it. Human beings are of equal importance. Nature is important. Human beings are very important. Human beings are equally important. Please underline that point. It's not as if human beings are of prime importance. Human beings, along with all life forms, become equally important. And the sensitivity that is asked by deep ecologists is something which actually links the individual and the social. The collective and the social can be connected. Deep ecology, as you can see, is something which is akin to the spiritual, something which takes us to a kind of spiritual level. This is what I uh, try to bring through ethics. Normally, eco-critics will not accept an ethical argument as such because it has to come from within the context of the text. But here, ethics is not something which is drawn from outside, but something which is uh, uh, aimed within the whole meaning of a, a text. What is aimed is, is life-enhancing quality, qualitative values, not quantitative values, qualitative values, very much similar to a sort of spiritual enlightenment or artistic fulfillment. After all, life becomes meaningful only when we start to live it fully and selflessly. So fullness of life becomes, uh, uh, I mean, life becomes complete when there is a selflessness about it. 
so this is what living uh, uh, locally and thinking globally you know so that sort of you know being able to recognize that earth is not something which we have inherited uh, uh, we we have from our forefathers but we should realize as what mahatma gandhi used to underline and repeat this is something which we have borrowed from our children so we have no business to destroy whatever is around us we have to recognize that our uh, uh, you know sublimation of the self is not through aggrandizement but through a kind of deeper understanding and understanding and sympathy compassion i have written in in, in one, one of my essays i have mentioned that passion and compassion are at the core of a uh, uh, literary uh, you know uh, eco critical theory environmentally sensitive critical think- thinking passion and compassion are at the uh, they are the the major uh, linchpins they are something which actually holds together the whole idea of you know ecologically sensitive criticism so with these few words you know i'll uh, come to the uh, end of my lecture the beginning of this webinar if there are questions i'm willing to uh, answer them thank you very much once again i should thank the, the organizers of this seminar especially for having uh, you know uh, given me a chance to talk to you from my home and it is a wonderful reach out opportunity because of this covid situation you hardly get a chance to talk to a person because you are not meeting people in the in the in their physical sense you are not talking to each other and to be able to go out and talk without a mask is something valuable so i enjoy these moments i hope you also enjoyed it you know i'm worried about the technicalities of the whole thing because in between there have been so much you know construction uh, uh, problems well anyway i'm glad that you know i could talk to you thank you very much once again my friends hello if our participants have any doubts or questions please comment in the chat box sir this is the time for interaction okay uh, here are some some questions how can we link should we approach the text based on environment ethics for dissertation can you explain how it's going so far? Somebody has asked about, you know, the new concept of uh, environment. The new concept of environment is something which actually talks about human relations with nature. There's a formalist sort of, you know, uh, construction. It happened in in the uh, early part of the, I mean, even first century. There have been uh, um, writers, I mean, uh, 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 poets in the Tamil country. and the whole age was called sangam period when the collective efforts of poetry uh, which was formalistically codified by a text called tolkapiyam no tolkapiyam is something which is uh, uh, which uh, uh, who wrote tolkapiyam so we, uh, the answer that we can give is tolkapiyam wrote tolkapiyam what it will appear right tolka peer wrote tolka so the writer and the text becomes important and tolka peer actually is a, a, a text of grammar which actually spends 
uh, uh, which focuses attention on uh, different levels of uh, discourse the the, the spoken the oral the, the sul sul and speech uh, discourse then you have edit which is the writing and then you have purul which is meaning so three levels uh, sul edit and meaning and this how this uh, in three levels uh, um, you know grammar becomes significant it's a formalist uh, formalistically uh, a codified way of human nature relationship because when the uh, 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 when the poet uh, the man and the woman sp- uh, speaker in the uh, in, in the text in a 15 uh, text at one go and when you read this text you will actually find that the the reader the the the, the voice in the text actually uh, brings certain objective correlatives from nature and then there is this uh, whole idea of uh, tinai which is uh, inner and outer uh, agatinai as well as puratinai so you have agam centered poems which actually speak about the inside uh, the inner version Uh, like love compassion relationship even sexuality for that matter all those things are spoken about in agatinai and then you have the puratinai which talks about the war and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, taking away raiding other cattle and so many other things which are dependent on a particular culture so you have the inside and the outside and the whole idea of uh, 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 you know uh, tinai aesthetics is the interrelationship between the inner and outside it's fabulous it is the, the tremendous way in which you know these writers in those times you know, almost at the same time that varada was uh, you know creating his natishas the first uh, sanskrit text treatise on uh, uh, aesthetics so in a similar time you know this was uh, also created so you can see people in the tamil country how they have spoken about the inner and the outer in that way so these uh, uh, two levels have been brought together in the tenai aesthetics and there is a possibility for you to find parallels between the present and that time but we we should not actually uh, uh, think about you know uh, uh, ecologists have said it all uh, or uh, environmentalists have mentioned all this or literature has said it all you know ramayana has said it all or what we he has said it all in so in a similar way we we cannot find a finality in saying that the tenai aesthetics is the ultimate be all and end all but it gives us a kind of springboard for exploring our own uh, you know present like that <laughs> what do you think is the role of literature in creating an ecocentric culture especially when our future is threatened by pollution and destruction is the role of literature limited to theory or is there a scope for more active practical involvement good question very good question my whole process is <laughs> my process of my lecture like, was actually talking about this uh, pra- uh, theory and pra- uh, praxis at the same time uh, action is there uh, environment lessons of environmental justice which Uh, literature would actually provide us with you know literary text can be a platform for discussing uh, proactive measures in the in the in the world outside so in that way to that extent you see it's like a sign board a sign board which might take okay, this is actually the road to mumbai uh, in mumbai 100 kilometers or delhi 200 kilometers the board is there which shows the sign it doesn't mean that the board takes you there you can't kick the board and say take me to mumbai so in a similar way literature can be a kind of index literature can actually lead you to these sort of things the literary text cannot be actually used as a kind of you know uh, 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 something which you can take outside to to make uh, peace or to create justice now all these things are also judgment Now we are assuming that literature is something which is like a propaganda you you write literature you create literature to create revolution you create paintings for creating revolution it's not as if a particular painting or a particular cinema or a particular text is something which is revolutionary it creates or it speaks only about revolution it speaks only about environmental justice but it is for the reader to make sense of it. 
uh, with one single painting you know Pablo Picasso actually created a whole revolution Picasso was Guernica for that matter it is about a small town in Spain being bombed the impact of that it's not as if he is talking about revolution or impact of the bombing but he is just showing depicting something through his medium he is able to explore a sort of revolutionary or a transformative change in perception so it is through the medium that this is happening in a similar way in, through the text the literary author i didn't want to give you individual examples innumerable examples we can present in the in the contemporary times take up a text and talk about this particular thing there have been so many writers you know poets philosophers dramatists uh, novelists or even non fiction writers who have actually focused attention on this particular aspect you take a penny text for that matter that's what i try to draw attention to you know, we assume that literature will give you a uh, 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 nature and literature that is the only text which will actually give us any idea about li uh, literature and nature that's not right all texts all writing can be analyzed from the point of view of eco aesthetic theories all literary and aesthetic activities are amenable to this this sort of theoretical thing okay there is another question here how to balance ecological aspect and literary aspect of eco critical analysis of a literary text how to balance ecological aspect and literary aspect of an eco critical analysis of a literary text i raised this question because when i would like to take up nature culture binary as my key concern in analyzing the text I got some response that eco criticism has moved forward a lot, probing into textual aspects like eco linguistics, etc. It may be repetitive to consider nature culture binary. I would like to hear from you. Uh, I didn't actually understand your question. See, literary theories are not competitive. Literary theories, or uh, uh, you know, theorizing a particular way, is not something which is. Uh, present and past you can even read shakespeare in the present it's not as if you know shakespeare is passing nobody talks about wordsworth anymore or the wordsworth is somebody who spoke about nature eco critics in the present don't talk about wordsworth if you say that then i think it is being very amateurish way of looking at literature all texts all authors all meaning producing kind of thing can be interpreted the way in which you interpret it, the way in which you make you try to make sense that is more important if you think that you know this binary between literature and nature is passing is something which is already gone which is which is irrelevant then you will not be able to process yourself there is nothing wrong in raising this question of the binary see this binary itself was deconstructed for instance literature and culture the whole idea of Uh, i mean a uh, uh, culture and nature this was a binary which was actually created by levi strauss levi strauss in another context in in, in structural uh, anthropology he was talking about this nature and culture divide nature versus culture now nature culture divide was something which existed for a, a, a structuralist like levi strauss for him you know he he could see it But if we see with so clearly blatant anyone who is familiar with levi strauss you will get hooked on to his kind of theories you you read him his raw and the cooked or any of these things you will get hooked on to the way in which this astutely brilliant man has uh, made use of you know uh, uh, structuralist theories to talk about uh, human history as such or uh, sociology for that matter or social linguistics you know. or structural linguistics or structural anthropology for that matter whole history of mankind but here comes derrida and he looks at it and he tries to uh, uh, you know uh, deconstruct it now what he has done is it is not making levi strauss's theories irrelevant but he is making use of levi strauss to recognize that this binary does not exist now this is astuteness this is not merely to show that one is intelligent and brainy so that one can point out mistakes and poke holes in others arguments but this is to show you how you can be perceptive what is required here is you should show your perception your openness and your frankness and your relevance you can find through your own process of reading thank you
हेलो या आई कैन हियर यू प्लीज एनी अदर क्वेश्चन ओके गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल लेट मी थैंक in this era of digitalized classrooms and education we could participate in many national as well as international webinars and we were also searching for a better resource person to present our webinar fortunately we got a versatile scholar dr murali shivaramakrishnan professor and former hod of the department of english pondicherry central university He is the author of many books and has bagged many awards. And as you know, he is the spokes spokesman of green literature in India. And he accepted our invitation without any hesitation. And he presented the topic people and nature, literature, ecology, and ethics very well. Thank you so much, sir. for presenting such a variety topic before us i thank our college principal dr abdul nasser sir for supporting and giving suggestions to conduct such a webinar i thank all the faculties of the department of english mao college of arts and science elu and i also thank all the participants who carefully attended and made this webinar webinar a live one thank you all once again our feedback will be available in the chat box thank you all thank you very much right आयती अच्छा <laughs> 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 इस आना रखोड़े दे हाँ हाँ सर